Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. Well, you know, I recently discovered the Virginia Association of Planning Districts, which is an organization comprised of 21 planning district commissions across the Commonwealth of Virginia. Now, I was amazed by the scope and range of the projects, activities, and impact by the regional planning district commissions. So joining me to discuss the work of two of the regional planning commissions are two guests. Jeremy Holmes is the executive director of the Roanoke Valley Allegheny Regional Commission, and Kevin Bird is executive director of the New River Valley Regional Commission. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, so before we, we begin, and, and at a 30,000 kind of foot view, could you tell us a little bit what is, first of all, the Virginia Association of Planning Districts and a little bit of history of it. How did it come about? Sure, well, there's 21 planning districts in Virginia. Um, many of us were chartered in the late 60s and early 70s. And in the late 80s, the Virginia Association of Planning District Commissions was established really to help those 21 regions work together in projects that might help address challenges that our local, state, or federal partners uh, can, can help address. So that really, that umbrella organization helps us work together across the state. So the, the umbrella is more of a coordinating and sharing, and then there's a certain amount of independence between and among the, 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 the commissions then. Correct. So, um, Let's uh, focus on your organization. So each of you, first of all, tell us a little bit specific to you. What are your service areas? I'll begin with you. Sure. Well, the Newer Valley, we have four counties, Montgomery, Floyd, Pulaski, Giles, and the city of Radford. And we also have 10 towns within those four counties that we work with. In the Newer Valley, we have unique enabling legislation from the General Assembly that was established in the year 2000 that allowed higher education members to participate as well. Mm -hmm. So since 2000, we've had Virginia Tech and Radford Universities as, as members. And then uh, a few years ago, we used that higher education banner to add New River Community College as a full member as well. Wow, wow. So in, 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 the, in our area, we cover uh, Roanoke Valley, so the Roanoke metro area, Roanoke City, Roanoke County, Salem, and Vinton, um, up to the Allegheny Highlands, so uh, Allegheny County, Clifton Forge, and Covington, and everything in between. Um, and then we also share Franklin County as a joint member, actually, of both our regional commission as well as the West Piedmont Planning District Commission. They see some economic and community development connections, so they uh, joined us about 10, 15 years ago and work with um, the localities in our main service area to kind of a, a, a across all of our needs. And tell a little bit about the organization of the commissioners. I mean, are, are they the same or do you have some flexibility to share how your particular organization is? Sure, well, state code says that we have to have 51% or more elected officials on our boards. So each of our local governments appoint an elected official to serve on our board. And then the communities that have more than 3,500 in population, they also have the ability to appoint a citizen representative. So we have a good mix of elected officials and citizens, and we also have the higher education members, and those are often vice president level roles within the institutions. So we have a 26 person board that represents the Newer Valley. Ah, and your organization. And we're very similar. We have a 30 person commission, um, much like um, Kevin's organization. 51% uh, of those have to be elected officials appointed by uh, their councils and boards. So of course, as those change, often our membership ch changes. Um, we have uh, about half of the other half of the folks are citizen members. Um, in many cases, we have s uh, administration staff from our localities. So our city managers, our county administrators are uh, part of our citizen members. Um, and then we also have non-voting members from our chambers of commerce, our economic development and tourism organizations. Uh, it's just a way for them to make sure they're engaging with the work that happens at the commission. So describe for us your source of funding. Sure. Well, um, that's one of our greatest strengths is that we're able to pool a lot of different financial resources together to make projects work. We receive a base level of funding in our region is $1.32 per capita from all of our local government members and higher education members. Mm -hmm. So for us, that generates around $260,000. And we use that as match money and leverage to go secure competitive grants at a state or federal level. So we take that $260,000 and at the end of the year, we have around a $5 million budget. So we're able to really promote a uh, uh, return on investment about 10 to one on an annual basis for a lot of our members. Wow. Yeah, and, and again, our core, our core financing is, is very similar. Um, 
We, uh, about half of our work, because we are, have a large metro area, uh, we are the, the largest metro area west of Richmond, about half of our work actually comes from federal transportation dollars. So we are, um, in addition to being the regional commission, we are the transportation planning organization for the, um, for the region. So when transport federal dollars come uh, onto projects, they have to come through us. And so uh, a, a fair amount of our funding is geared towards uh, running all those transportation programs. And then small projects, small grant programs as they come up or uh, special funding pots from our localities that are often very project uh, based on a particular need for a particular year. Well, before we um, talk about some of the specific and exciting things that y'all have been involved in and are doing, uh, from a 30,000 foot level again, how do you collaborate with community organizations? Tell us a little bit about the process if you would. Yeah, it's rarely ever a straightforward point <laughs> A to point B process, um, but it takes us in really innovative places. Um, and I can give you an example of a project in uh, Price's Fork community just outside of Blacksburg. There was an old elementary school that was being taken offline. County was building a new school and a private developer purchased the old school and reached out to us and several other partners and said, hey, you know, how can we make this a dynamic community space? We know there's a need for housing. What can we do that would be exciting about food? And said, well, let us help do some visioning work within the community and figure out what the community will support. Um, and through that whole process, we ended up having lots of private sector, public sector, and nonprofit partners come together to redevelop the old Prices Fork Elementary School that netted 16 classroom or 16 apartment units being converted into classroom spaces, another 16 units that are adjacent to that facility. And then the classroom or the, the uh, kindergarten pod was converted to a microbrewery <laughs> and a commercial kitchen for food based entrepreneurs in the cafeteria and gymnasium space was converted to a Mexican restaurant. Um, and so it was really turned into this anchor community area in a rural community and our role in that was helping to uh, secure some of the state and federal funds and helping to monitor the expenditure of funds and tie that partnership together. So rarely is it ever point A to point B, um, but we provide flexibility in uh, helping to secure funds and administrative funds. And similar process, I guess, in how you collaborate? Yeah, sometimes it, it can be very based on what a particular need is. I always say like for us, it, it definitely starts with our commission board. You know, say our, that room is the only time all of the elected, uh, elected official or leader from every single locality gets around the same table to talk about what they need. So that, that's where a lot of those conversations start. But you know, our job really is to be a convener. So we're always looking at for opportunities, things that maybe our localities uh, opportunities they haven't identified or efficiencies and our job is often to you know try to bring those folks together um, it can maybe be all governments it can be combinations of governments nonprofit private folks just you know who needs to be in the room to address a particular need um, and then we are just a neutral party that that, that pulls those folks together um, so and it state federal there's all kinds of folks our job is really to understand how those pieces fit together, understand how those relationships work, and try to find the most efficient way to get to the right end product. Well, let's look at some of the, um, let you provide some examples of projects and activities, recent or planned, and do it by the areas identified. And let's start with the economy. What are examples of things that you have done, the commission's done, in terms of the economy in general? Well, we both have a key role in <clears throat> providing what's called the comprehensive economic development strategies for our region. Um, our role in economic development is often behind the scenes. We're helping the communities identify what their um, strategies are and their top priorities are. And then we're working with communities to identify those projects that are going to help them be successful in the current and future emerging economies. Whereas we have partner organizations that are doing the recruitment of jobs and the retention of jobs. We're there working on the strategies and helping to identify what funding might come into play to be able to secure water, sewer, broadband. So we have that policy, a guiding document that helps access funds and helps a lot of our partners access funds at the state and federal level. And yeah, I think where we often fit in is those, those pieces people don't necessarily think about the groundwork maybe before a project comes on board. So a, a couple of examples, it, um, in the Roanoke Valley, the Greenways, the whole concept of the Greenway started at the Regional Commission with mm. um, a, a leadership trip many, many years ago that got um, folks thinking about, you know, we have flooding on the Roanoke River, you know, what are some ways we can address that in the Greenways um, 
ha were born of that project. Of course, they're implemented by the localities, but the concept of this network came up through us. And of course, that's a big part of the economic development strategy for having a great outdoor community. Um, similarly, we've been very involved in the Allegheny Highlands on an outdoor recreation plan that's helping them um, put together the pieces for river access, for trail maintenance, for tourism, um, lodging, all those different pieces. So you know, we're helping them get those, uh, understand what the needs are, but of course they and private sector and other partners will take that um, and actually put together the, you know, whatever that final economic development project or effort looks like. Another area that you have at projects is housing. And I don't know, is that your largest area? But I came across a press release that was announcing some $40 million grant um, that, that uh, addresses some of the housing. So share with us some of the activity in housing and is that your largest um, concern? Right, um, certainly a pressing issue in all of our communities right now. Um, we're fortunate that we have a relationship with Virginia Housing. Um, that's where the $40 million of grant funds went out to planning districts across the Commonwealth. And we had the opportunity to pursue funds in a $1 million, $2 million, or $3 million buckets based on our population size. So in the New River Valley, we were in that $2 million category. And what we're doing with that funds is looking to create an innovative program that's going to create um, a regional housing trust fund. And right now, when we go after affordable housing dollars for a project, we have to go to the state or federal government and in a competitive environment. What we want to do is create some discretionary funds within the region. So we're looking to use the $2 million as seed funds to start that regional housing trust fund and attract other local investment into that. Um, and this summer, we're going to have an RFP process for developers to access some of those funds to put units on the street. So we have a commitment to 20 housing units as a part of that $2 million. And in case, is it affordable housing? Is that kind of the area of most concern? In the so um, yeah, I think broadly housing, any kind of housing, diversity, uh, amount of housing is, is a need in, in, in all of our regions. You know, we similarly participated in the, the Virginia Housing Program. For us, that went directly into um, projects. So we worked, uh, did an RFP, had a number of um, developers and, and other um, uh, firms kind of uh, apply for those funds and in the end the moment we're looking at built bringing 71 units online with um with that with that two million dollars and more coming you know more, more broadly like in 2020 we completed a comprehensive regional uh, housing study and needs analysis for the region and and uh, our role you know, as we continue to work in housing is how do our regions work together to make sure that housing matches up with our job announcements um, our land use, you know, how can we best make sure that all that's happening in coordination so our housing can follow the economic growth um, uh, that we're seeing in the region. So there's more work coming in, in housing. It's not our biggest program, but it's definitely one of the biggest needs I think that we've identified. The area of community enhancement, you know, sometimes it really doesn't take a, a great deal of money to have an incredible impact in terms of community enhancements. Provide us some examples of uh, of, of that that you've been involved in. If you sure, well, one of my favorites I like to point to is the town of Floyd. Um, well over 10 years ago, we worked with the town on a community development block grant program that helped them figure out they are a cultural based economy. People wanna come there to experience culture and music really. Um, so 10 plus years ago, they helped uh, envision a downtown that could support more people coming to the Friday Night Jamboree. And as a result, you go there now and you can see the curvilinear walls that are along the sidewalks that allow the musicians to come outside and play in small groups. Um, there were structures that were removed and parking lots were installed. They have public restroom facilities there now. Um, so you can just see the improvements over time that also led to job creation as a result of that and um, small businesses that were opening adjacent to the, the uh, country store there in downtown. So yeah, the, these communities all across the region are benefiting from these community development projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we you know, work very closely with our localities on sort of identifying their needs. A couple of projects that come to mind is uh, we're working with the town of Clifton Forge and help them write a grant for an all abilities park to redevelop um, uh, some parkland in the middle of a neighborhood into a, an accessible park so that any child can use any of the equipment. And so we're the early process uh, on assisting them with that. Uh, we're working on a project uh, through the CDBG program called Better Bus Stops for Neighborhoods that's trying to improve some key neighborhoods in Roanoke City by installing um, artistic bus stops along you know, some of the most uh, 
most well-traveled bus routes that will be great for the bus riders, but also centerpieces for those neighborhoods. It will bring some art and color to the streetscape. So you know, there's a lot of little things that we do um, um, in that area, but those are, uh, anytime we can do things with particularly bringing, connecting art and culture with our community development efforts, or we're, we're always excited to pursue those. Um, transportation yeah. is another area that you are involved in. Examples there. So we have a, a big one right now in the New River Valley as we're working to extend the Amtrak service from Roanoke to Christiansburg. And that's been a 10 plus year effort. And I love to point to that example of a public, private, nonprofit collaborative that's made great progress. Um, we have the nonprofit and the Blacksburg partnership that was facilitating the public-private collaborative for a number of years. Our organization was involved in doing the technical studies initially to figure out what the ridership demand would be and where a potential station location would be. And we had the private sector that was using this information and working to inform our legislators and the diff three different governor's administrations over time about how important of a regional initiative this was. And uh, this, after 10 years of work, now we have over a $270 million commitment from the Commonwealth to make that investment a reality. And service is scheduled to start in 2026. I know it's hard to, hard to believe those of us in, in Blacksburg. I, I would have lost money. I was like, they're not gonna bring it out here or what have you. <laughs> and we get on the bus and go, but it's exciting. It's genuinely great. And of course, I'm gonna give a shout out to Senator Edwards who has been on that from the beginning. And of course he's retiring and so, uh, that was one of his uh, initiatives that he continued to work on as well. And so congratulations to him and, and to you for, for that. Transportation. Yeah, so um, we do any number of corridor studies, transportation projects with our localities. As I mentioned earlier, we, we play a very important role in the federal process for the Roanoke Valley um, as the TPO. Any federal dollar that goes on a transportation project has to come through um, a couple of levels of review um, uh, at, the, at the TPO level. So one of the big products we have is the Long Range Transportation Plan, which is sort of the regional vision on what do we want our transportation network to look like, what are our priorities for safety and mobility and congestion, um, and then what projects meet those goals and how are we going to get those funded. So um, it's an important part of the sort of checks and balances, but it's also one of the ways that we are able to get federal dollars here to, to fund things like the uh, Valley View Exchange, uh, Greenway Networks, bike lanes, mm -hmm. um, ID1 expan you know, expansions, a lot of those things fall under, as a matter of fact, uh, Kevin mentioned the, uh, the Virginia Passenger Rail Authority came to our TPO because there's rail that goes through our area that will need to serve that. So that they, they uh, come through us to make sure those federal dollars are available for those improvements. And hope the improvements on I-81 just keep right on going. We need more, <laughs> we're not done yet. We still have things uh, there. And finally, an area um, uh, of activity is the environment and natural resources. Mm -hmm. And some of those are really intertwined, but i uh, let you provide some uh, examples there. Sure, well, Jeremy mentioned convening earlier, and that's one of the key things our organizations do is convene leaders across the region so they have relationships to be able to do projects. Um, and in this environmental natural resource space, we convene what's called the New River Watershed Roundtable. They get together every quarter, and it's an hour and a half meeting of public sector, private sector, nonprofits, just to kind of share what they're doing with their work programs. Um, we have uh, partners that are doing water quality monitoring. Um, we have the state agencies that are, you know, biological services that are providing reports on what's happening. And through those relationships, we're able to coordinate uh, annual river cleanup uh, called Renew the New. This has been going on for over two decades in Giles County now. We took that model and said, how can we make this a regional effort? Effort. And about five years ago now, we've uh, made that a consistent August, early September uh, regional river cleanup. And we have over 500 participants every year that get in the river and clean up tons of trash on one Saturday every, uh, every August, September time frame. And it's a great time to get people in the, the river and experience it and then, you know, contribute to the community. And, and it's not an high impact um, and volunteerism and not all that expensive, but high impact. That's right, very high impact, and everybody walks away with a t-shirt. Volunteers <laughs> love t-shirts. <laughs> yes, yes, second only to hats, but yes. maybe we'll take, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, we, um, we actually do quite a bit with, with water as well. We, um, uh, one of the things we manage is the Roanoke River Blueways, which is a program that both 
is about water quality and making sure the Roanoke River is, is clean and usable, but is also a, a tourism and recreation um, effort to you know, help folks navigate the Roanoke River on a kayak or a canoe, do put-ins and take-outs. Um, but obviously, if they're going to do that, we want the Roanoke River to be clean and well managed, and so that's part of that's part of that program. Uh, we just the earlier launched a program. Um, with Roanoke County with helping them fund septic pump outs for rural citizens mm -hmm. to help uh, uh, keep water quality, improve water, groundwater quality. Uh, and we have a, a program that is working with our Chesapeake Bay localities, Botetot, um, Allegheny Craig, on practices to help make sure they're taking care of the watershed that eventually, and I, I didn't, don't think I knew to the extent to which we are also, we are involved in the Chesapeake Bay watershed and stuff that we do here makes it all the way out to the coast. Um, so those are a couple things we do. We also have some, um, a program that is both a transportation program, an environmental program that helps people get out of their cars, ride bikes, take the bus. Obviously that helps congestion, manages our roads better, but also improves air quality, reduces greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, try to get a little bit of everything in some of the work we do. And wow, what an extensive uh, list in areas of activities. But I help, help me understand um, a little bit. So um, to apply for some of the grants or to get help, can it, does it have to be governmental? Can it be private uh, organizations? In other words, can people come to you with, I've got a good idea? Or is it more organized groups already? You see what I'm trying to get at? In other words, how to get access and to participate even to start the conversation. How does one do that? Well, our organizations are owned by the local governments that we identified earlier. And so a lot of our work program is developed by the local governments. Now, I will say that we have lots of community partners that we work with regularly on projects. And so they may raise an opportunity area. We say, okay, let's put together a collaborative and go pursue some funding to see if we can address that specific challenge. Um, so it happens in a mixture of ways, but we're always making sure that we're supporting the local governments that really own these organizations and drive us on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Same with you. Yeah, it's the same answer. We, we, uh, we do the work that our lo local governments need. We're always open to good ideas, but that's always you know, filtered and vetted through um, the work that happens at the commission board level. Sometimes uh, some of our work is mandated. Sometimes it comes through VAPDC and efforts at the state that say, you know, you the planning district is actually the best place to implement a particular project. And so that may come from Virginia Housing, you know, th through us. But it's, it's very much focused on meeting the needs of uh, our local government members. Well, we talked about activities and we talked about uh, scope and scale, but on average, at any one time, take a snapshot, how many projects do you have that's active and ongoing at one time? How, how does that, what is that range? It's an impressive amount and it seems to grow every year because <laughs> the skill sets expand with our team and it's exciting, but uh, it, anywhere between 50 to 60 plus projects on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. Wow. Same yeah, with I think we, we, we have 15 staff, and if I were to ask them how many, how many things are you working on today, they would probably laugh at me. You know, there's, we, we do quite a bit with a small amount of staff, but of course we do that because we work very closely with our localities and partners. That they're the ones who ultimately implement uh, a lot of these things. So you know, most of our staff are working on two, three, four projects at any particular time. Oh boy, 50 to 60 in the extent of that. Well, we only have um, two or three moments remaining. So if you're looking into the crystal ball, looking to the future, are there certain goals or projects or area of focus, maybe the greatest need kind of thing as you're looking in the next near future, five, 10 years out? What well, do you see? Something that we'll be working on for the next several years <laughs> is broadband deployment. Ah. You know, the pandemic really elevated awareness, mm -hmm. just how critical infrastructure broadband is. It used to just be water and sewer. Now you gotta put a third one in there of broadband. We have to have it everywhere. Um, so we were successful in securing a $68 million grant from the Virginia Telecommunications Initiative to build out fiber to the home or business for everyone in Montgomery County, Pulaski County, and Bland County. So there's 20,000 connections that are going to get built over the next couple of years for, for broadband. And we're thrilled to be in that space because it's, it's been a rural challenge for far too long now. Absolutely. Far too long indeed. Uh, yes, sir. You know, go back to housing. That's a definitely a big need that we see. Um, uh, 
a, a real opportunity to bring people together to more, more proactively look at what we need to do on the housing side. Um, and we're getting very involved in what's happening on the Opioid Abatement Authority and the funding that's going to be coming down through that. That, that involves all these things, housing, transportation, um, medical care, getting everyone on the same page. And so that's, that's an area where we'll, 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 we will definitely be assisting our localities for, I believe, the next 17 years at least is, what, is how much funding they're anticipating. So it sounds like you really won't run out of projects per se. They're yeah. always there. <laughs> and what's impressive to me is not only the range and scope, but uh, as you say, public, private, take a few dollars and maximize it with other grants. And so that's what was amazing to me when, when I came across a couple of things and trying to understand, because I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure that I was aware of the commission's work specifically because in the press releases it kind of gets lost like in broadband or what have you. And so a very valuable partnership of those 21 commissions across Virginia. Well, believe it or not, that's all the time we have. I certainly want to thank my guests, Jeremy Holmes and Kevin Bird, And I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.